The Taiho was supposed to be the lead ship in a new type of Japanese aircraft carrier. Unfortunately for them, as it turned out, it would be the only ship of its particular class to be built. Interestingly enough, whilst the American Navy had gone for unarmoured flight decks in its Yorktown and Essex class carriers, and the British went the other way with armoured flight decks in everything except for the Ark Royal, the Japanese, although their pre-war carriers were unarmoured in much the same manner as the Americans, had decided to go down a third path when it came to their late 1930s and wartime construction. On the one hand, for speed and ease of construction, they had ordered over a dozen of the Unryu class, which were a modified Hiryu class design. These ships were of the unarmoured flight deck type, and were basic evolutions of Japanese design philosophies up until that point. However, Taiho was a heavily modified Shikaku type design, Perhaps presciently anticipating that their carriers would take a massive amount of battering, the Taiho was supposed to take multiple hits and still remain as a fighting unit, and for this reason, she carried an armoured flight deck and an armoured belt. So the Japanese had decided, why not both, and were building both armoured and unarmoured carriers at the same time, although the greater expense and technical complexity of the Taiho class meant that only Taiho and five of an improved variant were to be built alongside the 15 Unryus. Just a bit of a side note, but I think that Japanese uh, naming conventions do need a little bit more recognition, as... To most people, Taiho just sounds like another Japanese word, whereas if you actually look into the translation, it means Great Phoenix, which is actually a pretty awesome name for a ship to have. And when you go back through a lot of Japanese capital ship naming conventions during World War II, quite a lot of these ships actually have very cool sounding names, as well as the standard let's name a ship after a state or city that a lot of people all across the world seem to like doing with their naval ships. Compared to the Shikaku upon which it was based, the Taiho sacrificed about one squadron of aircraft in exchange for its armour, being able to carry approximately 65 aircraft into combat. The armour of the ship consisted of a 3 inch thick upper deck and a lower deck with 1.3 inches of armour plate. In addition, an armour belt of varying thickness ran along the side of the ship, being just over 2 inches thick over the machinery spaces and 6 inches thick over the magazine spaces. This kind of heavy side armour was actually in excess of even the British armoured carriers, and was one of several design flaws present in the Taiho. You might notice from the pictures that we've been showing you that the Taiho appears to be quite low in the water compared to most other carriers, including the British ones, which sit quite high above the water, and this was as a result of the weight of that side armour. The ship in fact sat so low in the water that her lower hangar deck was only just above the water line, and her two elevator wells actually ran below the water line. Although obviously the elevators themselves being mounted in the wells were just above the water line, which is just as well. This factor would come back to haunt her later on. Additionally, whilst the bomb and torpedo magazines, as we explained earlier, were heavily protected by armour, the fuel tanks for the aviation fuel used by her aircraft were only partially protected, and this would also come back to haunt her in her last battle. With eight boilers generating 160,000 horsepower, she was capable of just over 33 knots, which was pretty quick and quite useful for a carrier, because obviously they need to be able to maintain a high speed to increase the apparent airspeed over the deck to get aircraft airborne as quickly and as efficiently as possible. In an effort to further fireproof the ship, the flight deck was not covered with wooden planks over the armour, but rather with latex. This was quicker to apply and easier to repair, however it was somewhat less anti-skid and could crack over time, especially when exposed to cold weather. She was also supposed to be equipped with catapults to help her aircraft take off, however a viable catapult design was not ready by the time she was constructed, and so instead they stuck a bunch of rockets in the storage areas to help aircraft take off that way, i.e. just strap a couple of rockets to the side of the aircraft, light the blue touch paper, retire, and hope the pilot is good enough to keep the aircraft under control until he can ditch the rockets. <laughs> 
For defence, the Taiho would be equipped with a number of radar sets, along with a secondary dash anti-aircraft battery of 12 3.9-inch anti-aircraft guns in six twin-gun turrets, three on each side, and a total of 51 of the rather appalling 25mm anti-aircraft cannons in 17 triple mounts. Although, to be perfectly honest, they probably could have just not installed them or maybe exchanged that weight for other anti-aircraft guns, literally any other anti-aircraft gun, um, and it would have had a more beneficial effect. Taiho's design was finalised before World War II. She was laid down before Japan entered World War II with the attack on Pearl Harbour, with her lay-down date being 10th of July 1941. She would be launched in April 1943 and commissioned in March 1944. However, compared to the fleet she was supposed to come into service with, which would have numbered over 20 carriers according to the various plans the Japanese Navy had made, by mid-1944, the situation was somewhat different, with the United States Navy having had something to say about the number of carriers the Imperial Japanese Navy still possessed. Thus, only three months after commissioning, the Taiho would find itself taking part in the Battle of the Philippine Sea in June 1944. On the morning of the 19th of June, Taiho was launching her aircraft to form part of the Japanese second attack wave. However, her fate was not to be attacked by American carrier aircraft, but rather by submarines, since the USS Albacore had spotted the carriers earlier that morning and had been setting itself up for a shot. By this point, the Bureau of Ordnance had been dragged kicking and screaming into reality by various US Navy submarine captains, and the Albacore fired a spread of six torpedoes at the carrier. One of the pilots of Taiho's strike aircraft saw the torpedoes coming, and in a great display of devotion to duty, flew his aircraft straight down into the sea, into the path of one of the torpedoes, which caused it to detonate short of its target. Of the remaining five torpedoes, four of them would miss, but unfortunately for that pilot's brave display, the sixth torpedo still found its mark, hitting the carrier on the starboard side just forward of the island. Initially, the Taiho appeared to have weathered the impact relatively well. Although the forward elevator was jammed, Vice Admiral Ozawa ordered it planked over so that aircraft operations could resume, and the ship had only lost about a knot and a half in speed, and this was primarily to reduce the force of water coming through the hull. No fires appeared to have started, and so the carrier went on to launch two more waves of aircraft. Unfortunately, what was not immediately apparent was that those partially armoured fuel tanks and their supply pipes had been ruptured by the impact, and aviation gasoline was rapidly accumulating in the forward elevator pit. As this subsequently began to evaporate, it would permeate the upper and lower hangar decks, effectively turning both of them into gigantic fuel-air bombs. The danger posed by this was not lost on the crew, as the smell of uh, evaporating petrol is fairly obvious. However, with the ship only three months in commission, they were not very experienced, and so their efforts to counter this increasing danger were somewhat ineffective. One of the things an experienced crew would have done would have been to cover the gasoline with foam from the ship's fire suppression system in order to prevent it evaporating off further. And obviously the built-up fumes needed to be vented out of the hangar decks, but unfortunately, due to their inexperience, the crew didn't use the fire suppression foam, because hey, there wasn't a fire, and their attempts to ventilate the hangar decks were relatively unsuccessful as well. This was in part due to its design, as with fully enclosed hangars, any ventilation had to come from physically opening holes in the hangar itself. To their credit, they did try a number of things. They tried opening the actual ventilation duct gates that were installed for the purpose, they dropped the aft elevator, and they even smashed out some of the ship's portholes, but none of this was to much avail. And it was at this point that the fatal mistake was made. The chief damage control officer ordered the ship's ventilation systems to full, and every door and hatch that could be opened to be opened in order to try and get those fumes out of the hangar deck. Unfortunately, this basically just had the result of the ventilation system distributing the fumes evenly throughout the entire ship. 
And whilst the hangar deck crews had been relatively good about keeping that area spark and flame free, when you're talking about an entire ship with lots of electrical systems, engines, boilers, etc., there are inevitably going to be sparks somewhere in the ship, and at about 2.30 in the afternoon, one of those sparks coincided with that particular part of the ship being full of gasoline fumes, and there was a massive explosion. The force of this was such that a surviving officer on the bridge saw the entire flight deck heave up like a wave, and the sides of the ship blew out in massive fireballs. It was very clearly doomed at this point. Although destroyers and the cruiser Haguro took off as many survivors as they could, a second massive explosion blew through the ship about two hours later and she would sink stern first, taking 650 of her complement of 2,150 down with her. Although flaws in her design had contributed to her downfall, most especially the aircraft elevator well decks being so low, which had allowed fuel, gasoline and seawater to pool in them after the torpedo hit, the primary contributing factor to her loss was the poor damage control exhibited by her relatively inexperienced crew. This can be said because when you look on paper at the number of damage control systems the Taiho had, an experienced damage control crew would have been able to use those systems to relatively easily rid the ship of gasoline fumes, although given the outcome of the Battle of the Philippine Sea, this would probably only have been delaying the inevitable until a wave of Avengers or Dauntlesses showed up. This contrasts quite significantly with the superb training and effort put in by the damage control crews on American carriers, who were able to bring their ships home quite often despite absolutely horrific levels of damage. Uh, the Franklin and the Bunker Hill are obviously the go-to watchwords for that particular type of incident. But even when you look at the carriers that were lost, such as Yorktown or Lexington, even on these ships, damage control efforts managed to keep the ships afloat for considerable periods of time and resulted in most of their crews being saved. Ultimately then, the Taiho and her fate bear out one very important lesson that most navies are either forced to learn or are violently reminded of at various points during their history, which is that you can have the biggest, nastiest, most heavily armed, most heavily armoured, most technologically advanced ship... But ultimately, if your crew isn't up to standard, you really don't have anything worth calling a fighting machine. So always remember to treat and train your crews well, and then both crew and ship will come home at the end of the operation. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to tag your question with Q&A if you want to leave a question for the dry dock.